we weren't designed. We weren't designed to consume the amount of content that we consume. We, we weren't. And, and, and yeah, I believe that we evolve. I believe that things like, but I also believe that God created us to hear his voice. And, and, and when, when, when we're constantly consumed, I mean, the average American looks at this six hours a day, six hours a day. Now this is neither good nor bad, okay? It's just a piece of glass and metal and some chips in it. It is what we make it. But how in the world can we hear the voice of God when we're constantly hearing the voice of other people? It's too important. We have to be in the word of God. We have to be lowering the volume of life. We have to be slowing down. Hey, Fresh Life, we're so excited. We just literally finished in Texas. No, it's amazing. Second of three nights. People got saved. People walking and healing. It was unbelievable. And we want to greet you at every location. Yeah. Deer Lodge Prison, the Pando app, Church Online. Awesome. We love you. Awesome. Uh, our, we're sending our love. We have a couple Major more Fresh Life fans right here missing out getting Fresh Life tattoos. We love. <laughs> Uh, we're so excited. Next week we're in Alabama and then we're in Florida, awesome. Orlando, near Tampa as well. So you can still get your friends or even yeah. you can get out there and come join us. But right now we are so excited because all of us here are excited to introduce my friend Carlos. Hello! Hello. 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 He's from Nashville. We're from Nashville. We love Carlos. We know all the Whitakers are there. They've been skiing. They've been enjoying hey, all the time, all life. Losai and Sahela and Sayana. We love him. I know Carlos is going to bring an absolutely amazing message, a does. brilliant message in the Firebrand series. Because let's be real, is there anybody who's a more embodiment of a Firebrand no, than no, this man? No, I, don't, I don't think so. He's amazing. He opens his mouth, Holy Spirit calls out. His brand new book, How to Humans Out, if you haven't yet, you got to listen to it. Follow him on all the socials, at Los Wind. Carlos, I love you. Love You're you. a great friend. Love Thanks you. for friendly. preaching to allow us to be doing all this. Fresh Life, let's make some noise for Carlos. Fresh Life, so good to be with you. I am just so privileged and honored. I um, mean, I got my own hype video. That was incredible. I am honored to be here. I'm honored to be able to lean in at all of our campuses uh, all over the place. And uh, obviously, my family and I are here uh, in the great state of Montana. And um, we have been Montana-ing the last few days. Uh, if my brown skin is a little rosy on my cheeks, I was fly. Well, all it took was me going up chairlift number one for the wind to smack my face for about 15 straight minutes. Uh, and I'm all in. And so, but again, wherever you're watching this from, if you're online, uh, wherever it is, uh, I'm privileged and honored to be able to lean in for just a few minutes to what I honestly believe I mean, what, what, if, what if the revival, the revival that sets the world on fire begins here, fresh life? Like that literally can happen. And uh, because people are descending on all of your communities. Like, like, I feel like where every fresh life campus is, you know, we played the game in downtown Whitefish the other day. We were in a restaurant. And I was, well, it, was, it was a couple nights ago, there was like this cool Hallmark movie thing that was happening. And I was playing the I was playing the uh, the game with every person I walked by, Montanan or Californian. That that was just kind of what I was trying to figure out, and it didn't take long to figure it out, right? The Montanans had calluses on their hands, uh, and and the, and their clothes were like worn and used and not fresh and crisp. Uh, and, and so I know you know it's it's funny wherever all of these first life campuses are, people are descending to you. You, you understand that God is bringing people that are far from him directly to you, directly there. So if that's the case, wow, what a privilege you have to be his hands and feet in a really messy world. You know, so, so this morning, my, my message in this Firebrand series is entitled, Walk With People. Walk with people. Everyone at every location, repeat after me. Walk with people. Walk with people. When I say walk with people, the Bible tells me to walk with people that are way different than I am. That the Bible is calling us to walk with people that are nothing like us. God is sending people directly to you. So how in the world are we going to do this with 
the mind of Christ and being his hands and his feet. Because let's be honest, it has been rough the last few years. Can I get a witness? It's been hard. It's, it's been absolutely hard. People have lost their minds. And, and so it is so difficult to walk with people that have lost their minds. And I will be the first one to raise my hand that half my mind has been lost to, right? Like, like we all have lost our minds in some way, shape, or form, right? Because we, we've gone through something that none of us have ever gone through before. So we're all rookies at trying to figure this thing out, how to do this right. And so whenever I try to figure out how to walk like Jesus did, I just go straight back to the Word of God. Listen, you, you, can, you can listen to a bunch of podcasts. You can read a bunch of books. You, there, there's a lot of great resources out there to help you, but can I tell you something? The way that you walk like Jesus is you read the life of Jesus. You read the words of Jesus because the Word of God is living and active. Li living and active. Y'all know a lot of people that are living that aren't active, right? That, 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 is, that is true. There's a lot of people that are alive, but they're not active. But the Word of God is alive and it's active, which means it's moving and it's going to move you and it's going to move you in the right direction. But here's the thing. Before we get into the, the, the depths of a few stories I want to share with you from Scripture, I, I need you to understand that being His hands and feet in a messy world you are not going to be able to muster enough strength on your own to pull this off. The only way, can I step on this? Can I come down? Okay. Getting a little closer. That means I'm feeling it. If you want to be his hands and feet in a messy world, around people that are dehumanizing, around people that you vehemently dis disagree with, the only way is through the strength and the power of Holy Spirit. That, 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 that is the only way. And I know you all agree because we've all been trying to muster up our own strength the last few years. We've been trying to pull it off the last few years, but I'm telling you what, it's absolutely impossible to do this on your own. You have to have the palpable presence of Holy Spirit in your life. You have to. And, and, and here's the beautiful thing. We all have access to Holy Spirit. We all have access to have conversation with Holy Spirit, to ask Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, what do I do about this situation? I, Carlos was talking about walking with people, but I can't stand this person. So how in the world am I supposed to pull it off? That, there, there it is. You have to ask Holy Spirit and prepare to be able to hear. We, we, we can do this with Holy Spirit. And, and I'm telling you, this is the only way we can get there and walk around in this broken world. It's going to be impossible to do it without Holy Spirit. So let's get to it. How can we walk with people? Well, let's understand first thing first. Let's understand the role of Holy Spirit, okay? We have a role as humans, and Holy Spirit has a role. Now, if you look in Scripture, I didn't give this Scripture to you. I'm kind of going off my notes here already. I apologize. But, but if you look in Scripture, okay, literally it says in John 16 that the role of Holy Spirit, this is the role of Holy Spirit, ready? And when the Holy Spirit comes, he will convict the world of its sin and of God's righteousness and of the coming judgment. Here it is. Do you hear that? The role of Holy Spirit is to convict the world of sin. Now, here we go. We're already going to swallow some really big pills right away. That means it is not our role to convict the world of sin. Whew, I didn't get a whole lot of amens for that one. <laughs> and I understand why. I understand why. Because, man, it feels good. It feels good to convict the world of sin. But that is not our role. Our role is to be his hands and his feet. Our role is to get close to people. Our role is to, is to like free people so extravagantly that, that, and love people so ridiculously that they're like, what is wrong with this person? Can, can I tell you something? I mean, I'm so far off my notes now, I apologize. <laughs> but let me just tell you something. I, 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 I spend the majority of my time now, this is different the last two years since I've seen you, but the majority of my time is spent in the secular marketplace. 
I speak in corporate America. That, that's, what, that's what I do. Like, I'm, I'm out there. They, 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 they have me come and inspire them. And can I tell you something? As I'm speaking in the marketplace, right, not in churches, these people will come up to me to my book table afterwards. These, I mean, they, 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 they may be drinking while I'm there. You know, like, it's all these sales conferences. And they come up, and they're like, what is it about you? What, what is it about you? I, are, are you a Christian? I don't even have to say the name of Jesus. Do you know what they're sensing? They're sensing Holy Spirit. And I'm not out there convicting them. I'm actually radically loving them. But I, I, I feel like the church, maybe the last few years, has forgotten the power of prayer. Like the power of prayer, we can pray that Holy Spirit convicts someone of their sin. We don't have to play the role of Holy Spirit. When we start playing the role of Holy Spirit, oh, it gets dangerous, right? And we start seeing things fall completely apart. So from Jump Street, from the top of this message, I want everybody at every location to understand. Let's do this. Let's stop taking the role of Holy Spirit away from Holy Spirit. Allow Holy Spirit to do the convicting, and we do the radical loving. We, we, we do this, okay? That, that's what we do. We love people. Now, hey, does radically loving somebody mean that we just accept everything about them? Absolutely not. But we do not step into the role of Holy Spirit. Allow Holy Spirit to, I, I promise you, you're going to start seeing opportunities come around you. When you stop doing that, convicting people, and you start loving them, you're going to start seeing them coming to you, asking, what is it about you? What, what, what is it inside of you? So, so how do we do that? How do we get there? Back to my notes officially now. Okay. That was all for free. That was a whole other message. <laughs> Here's the thing. When I look at the life of Jesus and the life of his disciples, I think it's laid out really well how it is we can be his hands and his feet. And the first thing I think that we have to understand is if you really want Holy Spirit in your life, if you really want Holy Spirit to be the thing that exudes out of you, and allow Holy Spirit to do the convicting. You actually have to be in a space in your life where you can hear from Holy Spirit. And, and, and the way that you do that is not continuing at the pace of life that we are living. Because when I look in some of these stories, I mean, let's just quickly look at Luke uh, chapter 24. We've got uh, two of Jesus' disciples that are obviously really upset. This is after uh, the crucifixion and the resurrection, but they're really confused. And I love it what it says here. It says, now that same day, two of them were on their way to a village called Emmaus, which was about seven miles from Jerusalem. Together, they were discussing everything that had taken place. First of all, seven miles, that's a long walk. Okay, se seven miles. I, I don't know last time I walked seven miles ever. Okay, but I, this is actually very important. I want us to really look at this. Together, they were discussing everything that had taken place. And while they were discussing and arguing, Jesus himself came near and began to walk with them. But they were present, prevented from recognizing him. Then he asked them, what is this dispute that you're having with each other as you're walking? And they stopped walking and they looked discouraged. And the story goes on where, where they, they, they were kept from recognizing Jesus. And they start telling Jesus of the horrors that has happened the last few days. And Jesus actually pretends like, uh, like he doesn't understand, like he doesn't know what they're talking about. And then he goes to their house and it says, finally, um, they were able to recognize him and see him. And their lives were changed because of this interaction they had with Jesus. But what I want to get to in this story is that they were walking they were moving at a speed to allow Jesus to show up in their life. You see, I, I, I wonder if sometimes the way to catch up with Holy Spirit is to actually slow down. Slow down. You want to be marked by Jesus with this firebrand? I, I saw... Hopefully none of you guys were actually marked the other week when, when Pastor Levi was talking about that. I watched that message. I was like, y'all do some crazy stuff out here. <laughs> but you want to actually be marked by Jesus? Marked by Jesus. Can you imagine Jesus trying to mark you while you're sprinting around? That's going to be dangerous, man. 
You don't want to be marked by Jesus while you're running. You got to slow down, I believe, to be properly marked by Holy Spirit. Slow down. Even the pace at which I am tall king to you is be beginning to drive you crazy get to the point man come on carlos we got things to do no oh be still and know that I am God. The absolute need for every person watching this message to be filled to the brim with Holy Spirit. I can't emphasize it enough. We can't do this on our own. And the first step, I believe, in walking with people and being his hands and feet I, I titled the, the first point this, to slowly be, slowly be, and it's hard. But can I tell you, the constant scrolling of Twitter, go ahead and wiggle your toes because I'm coming at them, <laughs> is not filling you with the presence of Holy Spirit. The constant need for news and information is not filling you with the presence of Holy Spirit so that you can pour that back out in your community. Less is more. Be still. And I know stillness is scary. I know it is. I can prove it. Ready? That was 53 seconds. And y'all were freaking out. Did he forget his next line? What's happening? What's he doing? Oh my gosh, say something, Carlos. It's too quiet. Oh, friends, you want to be filled with the presence of Holy Spirit. Lower the volume of life. It's so necessary that we are filled to the brim. We're going to talk about being filled to the brim in just a second. But we're filled to the brim with Holy Spirit. So that when someone bumps into us, what gets poured out is Jesus. Yeah. See, that's why you want to be filled to the brim. Not, 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 not only halfway. When you're filled to the brim and someone bumps into you, Jesus pours out. Yeah. But when you're filling yourself to the brim with Twitter and Facebook and all of these other things, what pours out of you when you, when you get bumped into? Yeah, not, not Jesus. I mean, I don't want to blame something, but let's just go ahead and blame something. And he gets straight to the point, right? Like, we weren't designed. We weren't designed to consume the amount of content that we consume. We, we weren't. And, and, and yeah, I believe that we evolve. I believe that things like, but I also believe that God created us to hear his voice. And, and, and when, when, when we're constantly consumed, I mean, the average American looks at this six hours a day. Six hours a day. Now, this is neither good nor bad, okay? This is just a piece of glass and metal and some chips in it. It is what we make it. But how in the world can we hear the voice of God when we're constantly hearing the voice of other people? It's too important. We have to be in the word of God. We have to be 
lowering the volume of life. We have to be slowing down. I am currently right now, cameras, sorry, but I'm going to walk for a second. I'm walking <laughs> at three miles an hour. That's how fast I'm walking. That is how fast the average human being walks. Now, some of you with longer legs may walk at three and a half miles an hour. But we were designed to move at three miles an hour. So I like to call that God speed. God speed. What in your life can you slow down to God speed? What in your life is moving at three miles an hour? Again, I don't want to blame something, but let's blame something. You know, there, there was a study that I, uh, that I read for my next book that's coming out next September that shows that the amount of content we consume the last 30 minutes before bed because we use these things as our alarm clocks, and then the first 30 minutes we wake up, this is crazy, is more content than my great-grandparents consumed in a month. Wow. In a month. And, and so we, we wonder why we can't hear the voice of God and Holy Spirit, you've got to slow down. Go, go buy yourself an alarm clock, right? I think they still sell them at Target. Then you wake up in the morning, you don't start rubbing its face. <laughs> you don't start touching it. It just wakes you up, you know? Like, like, what are things that you can practically do, practically do to lower the volume of life so that the volume of Holy Spirit goes up in your life? What, what are things you, so that, that's a question to ask yourself today. You want to be marked by Christ, slow down so he can actually mark you. Slow down, walk, just like his disciples were walking when Jesus came near. Slowly be, slowly be. Second one, everyone in the room say, closely see. Okay. Here we go. Now, I'm, I'm at Fresh Life, where all the campuses are. Oh, we got some hunters in here. And I know, I, I, I've, I'm, I'm, re, I'm a recent convert to this way of living. And th there, there's, there's the, the little scope thing that you look at when you're looking for something far, far away. So when something's really far away, you want to pull out your binoculars or... Actually, I thought it was going to be binoculars, but now it's just like the single eye thing. What's that thing called, hunters? Scope, yeah. So I'm looking, and, and I can see what I'm going after far away. But when I get within 15 yards of this thing, am I still using that? Of course not, because now I'm close enough to be able to see. But I feel like as followers of Jesus in a deeply divided world, there's far too many of us that are trying to see people far from Jesus through our binoculars and our scopes. What if, and here's the thing, it feels a lot safer to see people that are far from Jesus with your binoculars. But can I tell you something? It's a horrible way to be the hands and feet of Jesus. It's a horrible way. First, and first things first, if you're looking at something through binoculars and then like it's super far away, if that thing moves like one step, it's gone. Now it takes me another 10 minutes to find it. Oh, there it is. And then it moves another foot. No, whoosh, it's gone. What a horrible way to see people. The way that we're actually called to see people is to get right here face to face. Oh, that is the only way people far from him are going to be led to him. It, it, it's the only way. So if step one is to be slowly be, to invite the voice of Holy Spirit. Now we've got the voice of Holy Spirit. Now we can hear where Holy Spirit is calling us to go. Oh, Holy Spirit's going to call us to go to some places that are going to make us really uncomfortable. Holy Spirit is going to call us to go places that we really want to just look at through binoculars. But there's a story in scripture that I think calls us to get a little bit closer. It's in the book of Acts. I love this story because it makes me uncomfortable. See, you've got Philip, who's a follower of Jesus, okay? And Philip, this is, this is after, you know, Jesus has been buried, resurrected, ascended to heaven. And it says in Acts chapter eight, verse 26, just go with me for a second. An angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, get up 
and go south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is the desert road. So he got up and he went. So again, first of all, Philip hears from God. He hears an angel speak. He hears from God himself. He's in a place where he can hear. I'm, I'm telling you, this is so important. You've got to be filled with Holy Spirit so you can hear. Once Holy Spirit tells you, or once you can hear Holy Spirit, he's going to tell you to go somewhere every single time. So Philip doesn't know where he's going. He, the Holy Spirit just says, the angel just says, go down to the road from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he got up and he went. There was an Ethiopian man, a eunuch, and high official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of her entire treasury. He had come to worship in Jerusalem and was sitting in his chariot on his way home, reading the prophet Isaiah out loud. Ready? Watch this. This is the second time in this story that Philip is going to hear from God. First time was an angel. Second time, the spirit told Philip, go and join that chariot. Let's stop right here for a second. Okay. Okay. God, I'm just hanging out at the house. Spirit tells me to go somewhere. Man, I, I don't want to go down to this desert road. I'm relaxing. Okay, fine. I'm walking down. Huh, what do you have for me here, God? Oh, yeah, okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I see, I see really far away. Maybe he pulled out his binoculars. I don't know. I, I see a guy. He's an Ethiopian guy coming down to that chariot. Yeah, I, I got, me and this guy have nothing in common. Literally, he's from another country. He's in a chariot. Man, I can't even afford a chariot. That's a really nice chariot. <laughs> he gets a little closer. Oh, he's a eunuch? I'll let you guys Google what a eunuch is. So now we got a guy from Ethiopia. He's riding in the lap of luxury in a chariot and he's a eunuch. At this point, Philip probably could have said, spirit, this guy is nothing like me. Like nothing, I, I, I mean, what, we have nothing in common. Oh man, I, I really wish the spirit would have just told Philip to stay right there and be like, Jesus loves you. <laughs> Maybe he, he could have like written on a sign real fast and like lifted it up. John three sixteen in the end zone. The Spirit told Philip, go and join the chariot. Man, here goes the Bible making us uncomfortable again, calling us to go and join chariots of people that are nothing like us, calling us to go and be his hands and feet face to face with people that are nothing like us, that we may even vehemently disagree with. I, don't get mad at me. I'm just reading the Bible. Now, he, here's where the presence of Holy Spirit in your life is going to be absolutely necessary. There is nothing in my being, in my body, in my strength. Because, I, I mean, we're all, we all have very strong opinions about a lot of things, right? We're a very opinionated society. So there's people, I mean, now we know things about our neighbors we should never even know. Like, you know that, that app next door? You ever heard of that app? What a horrible app. It's like Facebook for your neighborhood. So then suddenly, like, you know what, who everyone's voting for on your street. Who wants to know that? We're, we're not meant to know that stuff. Suddenly, we're inundated. It, people tell me all the time, the world's more divided than it's ever been. No, it's not. Read the history books. Pastor Levi loves history. Just open any history book. The world has been deeply divided for a long time. We just have more access to other people's opinions than we've ever had before. So how do we live and be his hands and feet when we know more than we're supposed to know. We can't do it on our own. It has to be through the presence of Holy Spirit. Because can I tell you something? I know, I don't know about you, but I know about me. There's some chariots with some bumper stickers on them. Well, Carlos, did you see the bumper sticker on that chariot? Yeah. The Spirit said, go up to the chariot. Friends, how in the world is the world that is far from Jesus ever going to know about him unless we follow the lead of the spirit and go up to the chariots of people that are nothing like us. Now Philip's at the chariot. It says that he ran up to it. Okay. Now what, God? Well, now watch this. Here's the cool part. The cool and even harder part. You thought that the, the, this point was hard enough? Oh, it gets even more impossible. Watch this. <laughs> When Philip ran up to it, he heard him reading the prophet Isaiah out loud. And he said, do you understand what you're reading? The Ethiopian said, well, how can I? Unless someone guides me. So he invited 
Philip. Ready? <laughs> to come up and sit with him in the chariot. Okay, Carlos. It was hard enough to go up to the chariot. I told you about the bumper stickers on the chariot. But now you're telling me I've got to get inside of the chariot? Yep. As followers of Jesus, we're called to get in the chariot. Everyone in the room and all the campuses say, get in the chariot. Say it like you believe it. Get in the chariot. Get in the chariot. Can I tell you something for us life? Getting in the chariot of somebody that doesn't look like you, think like you, believe like you, all the things, doesn't mean you're turning your back on your morals and values. But what it means is you're turning your heart, the heart of Jesus, towards them. How in the world is a broken and lost world supposed to know about Jesus if we are not getting in the chariot? We're called. We're call this is why when you read the Word of God, it messes you up. It messes me up all the time. It's difficult, but Fresh Life, I believe that revival can begin in all of these churches when we get in the chariot. And that's what we're going to have to do. And that's why that first step, being still, slowing down, is vital to us. It's vital. Because we've got to be able to be in a position to hear the voice of God. So that when the voice of God tells us to go and to be his hands and feet, we have the strength to do it. Step one is to slowly be. Step two is to closely see and to get in the chariot. And then last but not least, extravagantly free. Everyone in the room say extravagantly free. Okay. We're slowing down. We're moving at a pace where we can hear the voice of God. Got it. Okay, now we've got the strength to be able to walk up to these chariots of people that are nothing like us. Okay, got it. Sweet. I'm there. Now what? Well, can I tell you what happened in that story? As Philip went on, he actually led the Ethiopian to the Lord. He led him to the Lord and he baptized him, which is the whole point, right? He, he baptized him, led him to the Lord. He gave him freedom. You see, freedom is the ticket. Freedom was what we're looking for people to get. Freedom was what some people that are listening to this message at all of our campus are desperate to have is just a little bit of freedom. But the way that Jesus frees people isn't just a little bit. When Jesus frees people, he goes, crazy. When Jesus frees people, I mean, he doesn't just give 10% freedom. He gives 100% freedom, like all the way. Jesus was extravagant in his giving. He was extravagant in giving people freedom. Everything he did was extravagant. I mean, let's look at this story. One last story. I love this one. In John chapter 2, now, a lot of people know this story. It's of uh, Jesus and his first miracle. And it says, on the third day, a wedding took place in Cana of Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding as well. When the wine ran out, Jesus' mother told him, they don't have any wine. Well, what has this concern of yours to do with me, woman? I mean, listen, that was a little feisty, Jesus, okay? You know, don't let everyone, anyone ever tell you that Jesus didn't have a little feist in him, okay? Jesus asked, my hour has not yet come. And then I love how Mary turns to whoever she's talking to and just says, do whatever he tells you, right? So just do whatever Jesus tells you. His mother told the servants, now six stone water jars had been set there for Jewish purification. Each contained 20 or 30 gallons. Fill the jars with water, Jesus told them. So they filled them, here we go, to the brim. Filled them to the very top. Then he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the chief servant. And they did. When the chief servant tasted the water after it had become wine, he did not know where it came from. Though the servants who had drawn the water knew. He called to the groom and told him, everyone sets out the fine wine first. Then after people have drunk freely, the inferior wine. But you have kept the fine wine until now. Jesus performed this first sign in Cana of Galilee. He displayed his glory and his disciples believed in him. Let's for a second look at the absolute absurdity of this moment. 
This was, I mean, listen, I'm no maitre d', but it says that this was the fine wine, the good stuff. And I've been to a lot of weddings. You don't run out of wine at the beginning of a wedding. So this had to have been the end of the wedding. Now, the groom had to have been embarrassed, right? Like, man, we ran out of wine. How embarrassing. And <laughs> this is crazy. Ready? Let's look at this. Six jars of 30 gallons. I don't know what kind of weddings you guys have. That's a lot. That's 100. I did the math. or I'm not, I'm not a good math student, but I did some math here. That's 180 gallons. I, I need us to remember the absurdity of this moment. That's 682 liters. Ready? That's 908 bottles of wine. At the end of the wedding, Jesus gave 908 bottles. It's absurd. Can I tell you something? That is what we are called to give. We are called to free people with absurdity. Literally, people need to be like, what in the world? How can this church? And I saw the gifts that you guys gave to a lot of incredible organizations. It was absurd. And that's what we're called to do. Be absurd in our generosity. Be absurd in our giving. Let me look at Jesus. Who does that? It is absolutely absurd. Now, what, what feels absurd is when the world looks at the church and we're getting in people's chariots. It looks absurd. Even to some of your Christian friends. Can you believe that Johnny got in that guy's chariot? Did you see the bumper sticker or the chariot that Johnny got in? It's going to look absurd. But the only way, I believe, to save a lost world is to step into the absurdity of the gospel. Step into the absurdity of who Jesus was. Can I tell you something? The world is waiting for the church to be absurd. The, the world is waiting for the church to be absurd in its generosity and its giving and its freeing of people. It's going to take us being absurd and really walking with people. I, um, I was traveling, gosh, it was about two years ago, and, and I got to see firsthand the absurdity of what the church can do when it comes together. I was in the Atlanta airport, and if you've ever been to the Atlanta airport, there's four terminals, A, B, C, uh, maybe 10 terminals, I can't remember, there's a lot of terminals. And, and, and as I went to the top of Terminal A, the escalators are super long. I get to the top, and I was hungry. So at the top of Terminal A, there's Christian chicken. Chick-fil-A is in there. So I was like, that's what I'm going for, Christian chicken. So I go, I order my number one, well-done fries, extra pickles. Perfect. Super excited about my meal. And I order my meal. And, I, and to the right of me, there was a, like a piano bar. And at the piano bar, there was this man just playing the piano. I mean, he's going to town. And I looked over at this man playing the piano, and every single person around him was like this. Nobody was paying attention to him. And, and you know, here I just written my book, How to Human, which I talk about slowly being, and you know, seeing people closely, freeing people extravagantly. So like, I, I wrote a book about this, and so I'm like, okay, this guy needs to be seen. Okay, so I just kind of think to myself, okay, how can I see him? Okay, so he's playing, no one's paying attention. I pull up a chair, probably awkwardly a little too close to him. Because <laughs> he was playing the piano, going to town, and he kept looking at me like this, and playing, and I'm looking. And he finally, after about a minute of me kind of going, <laughs> stops playing the piano and goes, man, what you doing? <laughs> I was like, oh, man. I just wanted you to see me, see you, because you're incredible. You're, you're amazing. I'm just try, I'm trying, I'm trying to do what Philip did. I'm trying to get close to his chariot. And I'm there. And he goes, what's your name? I go, my, my name's Carlos. What's, what's your name? He goes, my name's Tony. I go, Tony, how long have you been playing the piano? You're amazing. He goes, I've been playing here at the airport for 13 years. He goes, I, I got kidney disease. So every night I'm on dialysis, nine hours a night. But I wake up in the morning and I come here to the airport and I play the piano and it's 
I just love it. it. It heals me. I go, that's awesome, man. And I looked at his tip jar and I saw he had like 15 bucks in it. Now I had $60 in my pocket. Now I started thinking, oh, okay, I've seen him. Now I need to free him. See, seeing somebody, I think that's a great first step as believers, but freeing somebody is going to cost us. Freeing somebody is going to cost us a little bit more. And then I think to the story of Jesus and how extravagant he was. And I was thinking, man, like I could double his tip and still save a little bit of money for myself. Or I could give him the whole 60 bucks. So I'm thinking, I was like, Tony, what's the biggest tip you've ever gotten? And I was, I was, I was ready to just go, pow. He goes, $600. <laughs> well, can't do that. Huh. <gasps> Wait a second. Wait a second. See, my Instagram followers, I call them the Insta Familia, is what I call them. And, and, and we love to extravagantly free people. And I thought to myself, I only have 60 bucks. But I wonder how much they have. Now, I've got 27 minutes before my flight. I wonder how big of a tip we can give Tony. So I started live streaming and said, Insta Familia, I gave a little bit about Tony's story. I said, I got 27 minutes. How big of a tip can we give him? And can I tell you something, church? This is what I need you to know. I need you to know, like I said before, the world is desperate to see the church be his hands and feet. They, they, they may pretend and act like they don't want to see it. But trust me, they want to see it. They want to see the church look like Jesus. They want to see the church go from doing this to doing this. They want to see the church be his hands and feet. This is not the position of Jesus' hands and feet. It was this. And, and can I tell I, I got proof in the pudding that the world, modern day media, is desperate to see this. Because 24 hours later, let me show you what happened on television. Watch this clip. Back now with our play of the day, a feel-good Friday. Carlos Whitaker was enjoying lunch when the piano player captured his attention, noticing there was not a lot of money in his tip bowl, even though he was playing his heart out. Well, the two started talking, and it turns out that 66-year-old Tony plays piano every day, then gets dialysis every night. So Carlos had an idea to call on his Instagram followers for some, for some tips for Tony's playing, and the money kept pouring in. Yeah. And take a look at what happened next. They just deposited ten thousand dollars. They, one hundred seventy thousand strangers that loved your piano playing, and I asked them to give you money. You are loved. Come on, man. You are loved. You are adored. And I don't know what you need to do with ten thousand dollars, but it's yours. Wow. Wow. And since then, Carlos said his followers have raised more than sixty thousand dollars for tony's plane and i gotta say carlos whitaker you and your instagram followers you get the best humans yeah. award for this Friday. don't clap for me i only gave him 60 bucks <laughs> national news being jesus's hands and feet the world is desperate desperate for the church to do this. And I'm telling you, it changes people's lives. Do you, do you see the look on Tony's face? <laughs> 30 minutes, $10,000. And when I was like, they just, he, when he goes, who is they? <laughs> He's looking around. I was like, no, the instant familiar, they're on my phone. He's like, well, I want, I, I want that. I want to be part of the instant familia. So, so the next month and a half of my life, I was tech support for Tony on his Instagram. <laughs> he became like the godfather of the Insta Familia. He, he wanted to be a part. He wanted to be a part when people are freed. They want to free people. Free people, free people. This is what happens. Can I tell you something? Tony ended up giving over 20,000 of those dollars to the American Kidney Foundation. Why? Because free people, free people. I'm telling you, it's not complicated, but it is hard. It's actually not hard. It's impossible. 
This is actually an impossible message to live out. None of us have the strength, but it is completely possible when Holy Spirit is flowing through our veins. Can I tell you something else? Nobody, nobody asked me before they deposited $5 and $6. Can you tell me what Tony believes about this? Can you tell me who Tony voted for? Can you tell me? No, of course not. Because there's an, something intrinsically inside of every single human being that's a reflex of rescue. We all have that inside of us. We all do. Friends, how can we walk with people? I, I believe that this Firebrand series is going to unleash something in all of your communities. And that something is called revival. But revival begins out there when it begins in here. And the only reason, the only way for revival to begin inside of our hearts is to get uncomfortable. So, you know, Philip um, got in the chariot of the uh, Ethiopian. But can I tell you the chariot that I'm grateful someone got in? I'm glad Jesus got in my chariot. Jesus has gotten into all of our chariots. And for some of you, Jesus has been riding around next to you in your chariot for a long time, just waiting for you to say, hey, there's some water. What keeps me from being baptized? At all of our locations, I'm going to give us an opportunity right now as the band begins to come to ask a simple question. Have I allowed Jesus to get in my chariot? Question number one. Question number two, if Jesus is already in your chariot, whose chariot am I going to get in to be his hands and his feet? Those are two vital questions, but I don't want to leave this opportunity at all of our campuses without giving people an opportunity to let Jesus get in your chariot. If you've been listening to this message and you feel it, you know, a quickening of your heart, you feel it, that's, that's the palpable presence of Holy Spirit. If you feel like Holy Spirit is inviting you into relationship with Jesus, I'm going to ask everyone at all of our locations to close their eyes right now. And I'm going to pray a prayer. And I'm actually going to ask that every single person in every single room at every single location pray this prayer out loud in order to link arms with those that are praying it for the first time. But there's going to be some people that are going to pray this prayer for the first time at all of our locations. And this prayer is a prayer of Jesus getting in your chariot. This prayer is a prayer of salvation. When you pray this prayer, you will go from death to life. When you pray this prayer, everything will change. So with every head bowed and all of our eyes closed, I want everyone in every room to repeat this after me. Holy Spirit, we invite you into our lives. And Jesus, I confess that I'm a sinner. I'm in desperate need of you. I invite you into my life to be the Lord of my life. I turn from my sins and I face the cross and I invite you to be my savior. It is by the blood of the cross and the power of the resurrection that I declare I'm a Christian in the name of Jesus. Amen.